Let's check in with Joseph Lindsley in Ukraine. Joe. Joe. Little fucking Joe Lindsley. Joe Lindsley is quickly becoming an American treasure in broadcasting. Where does Europa end when all they ever meant was obliteration? All they offer is death, only death. It's all they ever done. And until our last breath, until death, we'll hold the fort. I know you'll be Music sent to us from Ukraine this morning from Joseph Lindsley. Joe, why uh, did you want to hear this today? Hey, Bob, good afternoon from Kiev. Uh, this is from a, Luxem- a, a band from Luxembourg, which I, had, I don't think I've ever heard of a band from Luxembourg before. Uh, the neo-folk band called Rome. And this is their song, Our Lady of the Legion. Uh, they made a whole album about Ukraine called Gates of Europe. And uh, I encourage people to look it up on Spotify or YouTube or iTunes. Uh, but it, in this album, they really go very deeply into the story of Ukraine and why Ukrainians are fighting. Uh, The band previously has made a powerful album about Rhodesia, which is uh, now called Zimbabwe, about the struggle for freedom uh, in in, in that part of Africa. Uh, And so in this song, Our Lady of the Legion, they they sort of powerfully put the story of Ukraine in this, you know, in in the context of a fight of of good versus evil. And uh, this, I'm sorry, there's a noise in the background. Uh, uh, Sorry, Bob. One second. I hope you don't hear that. Um, as long anyway, as it's not, I, as long as it's not an incoming missile or drone attacking you. No, it was just, it was, it was just an incoming call. For some reason, my, uh, my focus thing was off on my phone. Anyway, so, uh, we had air, uh, air alarms earlier today, but it's calm here in Kiev. And uh, this, uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's a, it's a good song to listen to as we think about, as we look at the debates, for example, in Washington about, uh, you know, funding for Ukraine and what this, what this fight is about. And certainly a lot of people in America and especially a lot of people in Europe, you know, they, they feel the threat of Russia. Uh, and so, you know, these powerful lines, uh, you know, until death, uh, and then they say to life will hold the fort. And, you know, in the end, the, uh, well, the, the song goes, uh, where does Europe end? And, you know, the, the idea of end uh, can be, you know, it's a border, but it's also an idea. Uh, and this is, you know, I know it's a big thing in the United States right now. Uh, talking about the, the southern border, obviously, you know, it's as we look at, you know, the, the Senate passed a funding bill for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and for the border, uh, the House is going seeming, seemingly going to object to it. And uh, but the people in America are worried about the border. And, and I think people here understand that they, they understand that concern. Uh, without a border, you don't have a country. Right. And, and you have to be able to control that. And Ukrainians feel that very deeply. Uh, and so and, and the song asks that question. Where does Europa end? And it's not just about the border, but what is the idea of Europe and of free countries? And, you know, will this idea of freedom prevail uh, against tyranny? And, you know, I, I've, I've had some interesting conversations in the past weeks uh, with, for example, uh, uh, people that have been down in Central America uh, to see what's happening on the other side of the U.S. border. And there are uh, there's some evidence of both Russian operatives and Chinese operatives uh, working to agitate uh, down there. And so, I mean, no wonder, I mean, because certainly the Russians know that if they can make the border issue in, in America, a, a, you know, more important uh, and, and more troublesome than what's happening here in Ukraine, then support for Ukraine will weaken. Interesting story in the Tribune today uh, about a woman with relatives in Western Ukraine. And uh, the, uh, the Trib story uh, talks about uh, restaurants and and businesses uh, displaying the uh, flag of Ukraine, and uh, then uh, also words like uh, "pray for Ukraine" and "support Ukraine." So uh, there are a lot of people around here who uh, are with you, Joseph. Yeah, and that, that actually that Chicago Tribune story, uh, you know, which also talks about the funding bill, uh, is very. Uh, fair and informative and captivating. So I encourage people to read it. But what one note uh, at the headline, it says, uh, local supporters of Ukraine urge passage of aid for war-torn nation, save democracy. And, you know, it's it's become sort of the standard adjective to put before Ukraine, uh, war-torn. And yeah, it, it is war-torn, but is that the only adjective we can use? I think we could also say 
uh, defiant. You know, passages of aid for defiant Ukraine, because that is also true. Uh, Ukraine has held on for two years. And, you know, at the moment, as I look out the window at Kiev, the city of Kiev around me, I mean, I know the hearts of everyone are incredibly heavy, but the city looks defiant. Uh, life is flourishing. People are even trying to, you know, open new businesses. Uh, as I saw that conference last week, there's a lot of innovation going on here with drones and other technology. Even in Kharkiv and Odessa, which are more frequently hit, uh, the spirit is defiance. And, you know, if you went to, uh, you know, say Oakland, California right now, you might feel a bit more war torn than if you even were in Kharkiv an hour after an airstrike uh, because of that defiant spirit. And so I don't think it's biased to, you know, to put that in the headline to say aid for defiant Ukraine. And because mm-hmm. part of the problem I understand that some of the Republican criticism that we're going to see these next few days uh, for the spending, you know, they don't know where it's going. And, and this is part of the, you know, the usual duplicity in Washington. I mean, most of that $60 billion for Ukraine is actually going to stay in the U.S. It's going to benefit the U.S. and people that work in the defense industry and all kinds of ancillary uh, industries. Uh, but there's still not in that bill anything to change the game. There's there's no permission uh, for uh, to hit targets within Russia. Uh, no provision of long range weapons, and and so th- th- this puts you know Ukraine can't criticize this because they have to be grateful, right? Even though, by the way, it was the United States that orchestrated the removal in the 1990s and um, 2000s of Ukraine's most powerful weapons. Uh, that we should always remember that. But uh, in, in this bill, it is is really life support, and most of the money in that bill goes to support uh, you know, Americans, really, and, and, to, and to buy new weapons for the U.S. Uh, and so that needs to be underscored as we look at these debates happening. And meanwhile, as another symbol of defiance, uh, we're just getting the news in the past few hours that uh, Ukrainians have destroyed yet another Russian ship in the Black Sea. Uh, using uh, This is from the Ukraine, uh, defense intelligence uh, uh, part of the Ukrainian military, which is really probably one of the most impressive military units in the world right now, because with very minimal resources, they do extraordinary things. And uh, using, it seems, uh, drones, they took out the Russian ship Caesar Kunikov, um, carrying 90 military personnel and, and a cargo of either ammunition or drones. And so piece by piece, I mean, this is the second time in two weeks, uh, there's been, a, uh, which is really happening every fortnight, actually, there's a major success for Ukraine in the Black Sea uh, and so Ukrainians are defiantly, uh, you know, doing extraordinary things against allegedly one of the world's most powerful and vast militaries. I'll tell you what really got to me uh, last night. I saw Richard Engel's NBC report uh, from Kherson, and uh, there was video of uh, the the city as it looked before the Russian invasion, and then uh, they took the city. Uh, the Russians did. The Ukrainians took it back, and and now they're they're just trying to hang on. And uh, it's uh, it's really uh, sad to see uh, that that once beautiful city uh, in in ruins for the most part. Yeah, and it's. I mean, I know a lot of uh, people from that city. I know a lot of foreign volunteers, Americans who incredibly bravely are there even now because everywhere in that city is susceptible to shelling every single day, and yet people are still. Are still living there, so it, it's extraordinary. And as I think about, you know, that song, you know, about from, from the band Rome, uh, Our Lady of the Legion, uh, and and the, about the gates of Europe, uh, and when we think about our problems in the U.S. and th- there's a, a Ukrainian woman, uh, I think she's Ukrainian, yeah, Dr. Sasha Zhivojik, she's uh, with the Ukrainian Institute of London, and she wrote these reflections. She was in Vienna uh, recently, and she said Vienna seems kind of soulless. Uh, she says especially after she had just been in Ukraine. Uh, she'd been in defiant cities like Kiev, Kherson, and Kharkiv, and she said those cities breathe resistance. And she said that the idea that she took from this uh, being in those Ukrainian cities, defend things that make you alive. And, and there's something about, you know, even in the hell of the war, uh, by, by knowing what you're fighting for, that gives you energy in life. And that's why I don't see war, a war-torn nation around me. I see defiance. Joseph Lindsley and Kiev, keep the faith, Joe. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you, Bob. Until tomorrow. Thank you for introducing Ukraine on your social media pages. That's very important that much more people can get more information about the situation here and how everybody can help Ukraine to stay stronger and to save all the world. What did you say?